when you think professional headphone, the names Audio-Technica, Bear Dynamic, and Sony pop into mind. No matter how much Odyssey and Sennheiser want to claim they provide studio-quality headphones, pro videographers and studio engineers are more often found using a Bear Dynamic or Sony headphone. Rode last week dropped their NTH100. This is their first headphone, and they say it is for professionals. Rode, as you likely know, is renowned for their microphones. They have all sorts of options, from cheap to expensive, from ribbon to dynamic to tube, from on-camera to in-studio. They pretty much cover the whole spectrum. Of course, I could not pass up the chance to review their first headphone. The NTH100 is $150. Let's find out what it can do. Rode has a lot to say about the NTH100. It can be a slog to read through all their material, plus the stuff their authorized dealers are emphasizing. Rode says that the 100 will provide, quote, exceptional sonic performance and superior comfort. They promise that this headphone will render incredibly accurate frequency response and ultra-low distortion. They claim exceptional detail and clarity, ideal for all forms of content creation, including music production, mixing and audio editing, podcasting, streaming, and location recording. In their FAQ section, Rode says that the 100 has, quote, a very flat frequency response ideal for mixing and critical listening. They promise that the deep sub-bass in your recordings is accurately presented. And, of course, Rode claims that the 100 will reproduce audio, quote, as it's meant to be heard. Rode says that the drivers are custom matched. These are 40mm dynamic drivers with a 32 ohm impedance and a sensitivity of 110 decibels. Rode's marketing is clearly aiming at the market which Audio Technica, Bear Dynamic, and Sony have cornered for decades. And in doing so, they've made some rather robust statements. Alright, so you cannot pretend that the 100 looks like any other headphone in the market. It is absolutely unique. I'm sure Rode was hoping that would be the case, and they've made this headphone stand out, for better or worse. The overall design of this headphone is eye-catching in its dark simplicity. The 100 is made of primarily plastic and metal. The ear cups are plastic, but it is thick and dense. This is not the type of plastic you find on the Odyssey LCD-1 or the Sennheiser HD560S, both of which comparably are much more fragile than what you get on the 100. The yoke and headband structure is metal, and boy is it thick and robust. The yoke attachment itself is part artistic flair and part military grade equipment. The curvature design is unnecessary, but it does fit right in with the rest of the aesthetics. The headband is adjusted using another proprietary system. There's a plastic knob that you have to turn in order to lock and unlock for adjusting the headband. Unfortunately, there's no identification for placement, so you're left to eyeball adjustment on both sides. Alternatively, you can try to get proper fit by unlocking and sliding the headband while wearing the headphones. The ear cups have full horizontal and vertical movement, which is what you will really want every headphone to have. This will offer a better chance of a more comfortable and accurate fit. Rode went all out with the padding on the 100. The ear pads are, as you might have guessed, proprietary. They have a wedge-shaped ear opening. The pads are memory foam with cool tech gel. This gel is supposed to absorb heat from your face and mitigate long-term discomfort. The headband has thick memory foam. Both the headband and ear pads are covered in Alcantara. The 100 comes with an 8-foot proprietary locking cable. You can insert the cable on either the left or right sides. The headphones also include a fairly nice carrying bag and some colored rings. Rode says that these rings are to help you add some flair to your cable. Eh, whatever. Rode says you can order replacement ear pads by contacting their customer service. Frankly, I have no idea how much these replacement ear pads are going to cost, but pretend it's going to be over 30 bucks. Rode currently sells replacement cables on their website in case you want more. The 100 has some weight to it. The bulk of that weight comes from the metal headband, which, as I said before, is thick. Let's talk about comfort. Rode's marketing lauds this headphone's unique fit and comfort. And I have to agree. The 100 is hands down one of the most comfortable plush headphones I have ever worn. 
The padding is very generous. The ear pads sit around my ears. The cool gel will immediately start to absorb heat, which will result in a cooling sensation. But this will eventually reach an equilibrium. In my experience, the cooling sensation disappeared after about 20 minutes. The ear pads are not particularly large and tend to bend my ears inward just a little. The headband padding never resulted in hot spots or discomfort. The 100 dampens external noises but does not create a noise-free environment. For example, I can easily still hear my desktop speakers and my mechanical keyboard, though the sounds are a little bit more muffled. I can easily wear the 100 for 4 hours without any difficulty. It has about average clamping force, no more than that of the HD6XX. Overall, the NTH100 has a ton of proprietary technology. Good or bad, you're stuck with Rode's ecosystem. But the construction here is top notch. There is not a single point of failure I can find on this headphone. The 100 is hands down one of the most comfortable headphones I have ever worn, and this includes headphones up to the $4,000 mark. I wish Rode had included a shorter cable. The one in the box is far too long for casual home use and certainly not appropriate for use with mobile devices. To test the NTH100, I used it with my Army ADI2 DAC, Burson 3XR, Liquid Spark, and Modi Stack, and the EcoZerta ITM03. I used the stock accessories and listened to my test playlist on Amazon Music HD and Cobuzz. The 100 does not need a dedicated amp. Feel free to plug this into your phone or PC if they still have a headphone jack. Adding power does not seem to make an audible difference in performance, and certainly does not appear to present greater clarity or soundstage. Rode says that the 100 has a flat bass response. My tests indicate that this headphone has a marginal mid-bass emphasis. In Mountains by Hans Zimmer, there's a rumble from the beginning. This builds into a crescendo. The 100 did present the sub-bass rumble from the beginning. It sounded similar to what I heard on the neutral Allo S4X. Transience was also similar between the two. When the crescendo hit, the 100 made the organ meld with the other instruments. The rolling thunder effect was marginally elevated and tended to drown out the other elements. In comparison, the S4X allowed the organ to sound clearer, more separated. This difference was not significant, but somewhat noticeable. When the vocals chimed in, they rose from the background until they were one step ahead of the other elements. In Conquer by Overwork, there's a rolling marble sound at the beginning. This pans from right to left to center. The 100 presented this sound and the panning. There are multiple drums in this track and the 100 rendered them clearly. Each drum strike was hard, but not sharp. There was some melding from one drum strike with each subsequent one. It appears that the 100's rendition of the drums was a little bit harder and louder than what I heard on the Allo S4X. I listened to several hip-hop songs including Pure Water, New Patek, Reel It In, and Uproar. On each occasion, the 100 easily presented the sub-bass without seeming to emphasize it. The subwoofer always sounded like it was in the middle of a medium-sized room. This was similar to what I heard on the Allo S4X. The vocals were two steps ahead of the instruments and retained their sparkle. The drums were slightly louder than the sub-bass. I listened to my Sicario playlist. I used these tracks to determine if there is any audible bass distortion. Traversing from low to high volumes, I could not hear any distortion. Overall, it appears that the NTH100 has neutral sub-bass but a marginally emphasized mid-bass. There's about average clarity in the bass region. Rode again promises flat response throughout the frequency range, including the mids. My tests indicate that this headphone has neutral mids. In Orla Gartland's song, Why Am I Like This, there is natural vocal grain and sibilance mixed into the track. The 100 presented both details without emphasizing either. This was similar to the neutral Aventone planar. The Allo S4X, in comparison, slightly emphasized the sibilance. Orla's voice was two steps ahead of the other instruments on the 100. The drums were louder than the other instruments, but did not drown out the vocals. There was some melding between the drums and guitar. In Watch It Back by Haim, the 100 again showed that it does not emphasize female vocal sibilance. This was again similar to what I heard on the Avatone Planar. At 8 seconds into the track, the primary singer says the word we and drags it out, making it sound gravely. The 100 rendered this detail. There are two backup vocalists, one in either channel. The 100 initially presented all three vocalists clearly with their individual tonalities. When the instruments played at maximum, the backup vocalists retained their separation and individual tonalities. The drums, bass, guitar, and piano all melded slightly. The drums generally were a little louder than the rest. The vocals remained two steps ahead of the other elements. 
In superposition by Jan the Giant, the 100% of the ukulele, drums and bass, but the drums were a little louder than the other instruments. All instruments melded their notes together slightly. The primary male vocalist was two steps ahead of the instruments. His vocal sibilance did not appear to be emphasized. There's a backup vocalist whose voice is layered beneath the primaries. Most headphones cannot reveal this subtle detail. The 100, surprisingly, did present this subtle detail. Between 1 minute and 10 and 1 minute and 20 seconds, there are sharp intakes of breaths. The 100 presented this detail clearly. Overall, the NTH-100 seems to have neutral rendition of mids. Vocals are about two steps ahead of instruments. There is good separation among mid-centric elements and above-average detail retrieval in this area. Rode claims a flat response to the frequency range, including treble. My tests indicate that the NTH-100 has, seemingly, neutral rendition here. In Scherzo for X-Wings, the 100 presented the brass and horns clearly. Their nasally signatures were easily audible. Their higher-pitched notes sounded similar to what I heard on the Aventone planar. The LOS 4X, however, has a slight emphasis in upper treble. I could hear the various group sets placed differently, some perpendicular to my ear, some at a slight angle. The 100 provides depth and width, but no verticality. In other words, sounds come from further out into the wings or deeper into the well, but none come from above or below. In Flight from the City, the 100 made the piano sound like it was about 6 feet away. Its bassy notes were very slightly emphasized and each note melded with the next. The cello was as loud as the piano and sounded, for the lack of better terminology, smooth. Both instruments melded their tonalities. I could easily hear the pops and sizzles and electric buzzing effects, I heard the creaking of wood on the pianist's bench and the shifting of the cello's weight. In Take 5 with the Dave Grubeck Quartet, the 100 rendered the piano in the right, drums in the left, saxophone center, and the bass one step behind. All instruments marginally melded their tonalities, but none seemed veiled. The saxophone was the loudest instrument in the mix. The saxophone's higher pitched notes seemed to have as much energy as what I heard on the neutral Aventone planar. The LOS 4X in comparison had a bit more emphasis. The cymbals are struck at different positions which should result in varying tonalities. The 100 did clearly render these subtle differences. Overall, the NTH-100 seems to have neutral treble. This headphone presents a non-fatiguing signature in this region. Even at excessive volumes, I could not get this headphone to sound harsh or piercing. Rode makes some bold claims about the detailability of the NTH-100. That is, unfortunately, par for the course as far as marketing goes. We have come to find over and over again that companies materially exaggerate the clarity, detail, and soundstage performance of their headphones. Here, with the 100, it seems to me that this headphone readily provides above average detail retrieval. Even subtle details, the type that elude headphones in the thousands of dollar range, seemed fairly obvious on the NTH-100. Creaking of wood, shifting of a cello's weight, sharp intakes of breaths, multiple vocalists, twangs of guitar strings, nasally signatures of brass and horns, layered vocals, pops and sizzles, electric buzzing, gravelly natures of voices. These types of details are clear on this headphone. For a more quantitative test, I used the song New Light by Kazuki. This track has layers of details including the sound of children playing, wind, rustling of grass, synth, piano, and footsteps. I count the number of footsteps I can hear in the first 60 seconds. The Sennheiser HD800S presents 22 footsteps. The Focal Clear, 18 footsteps. The Austrian Audio hi 65 presents 16 to 17. The hi 55 presents 16 footsteps. The hi 15 and the X25BT presented 13 to 14 footsteps. The Hi-Fi Mansandara, Aventone Planar, Sifka Phoenix, and Beta Dynamic DT1990 each present 10 to 11. The Monolith M1070, M1570, Sifka Robin, and Ultrasone Pro 1480i all provide 8 to 9 footsteps. The Odyssey LCD2 Closed and LCD2 Classic each provide 7 to 8 footsteps. The older M1060C provides 7 footsteps. The Odyssey LCD1 and HD6XX present 6 to 7. The Neumann NDH20 presents 5 to 6 footsteps. The NTH100 rendered 8 to 9 footsteps. On my scale of detail retrieval, the HD6XX and LCD1 are the average performers. Any headphone that provides more or less detail is judged accordingly. So the NTH20 would be considered as below average and the Hi-Fi Mansundara as above average. Here, based on this scale, I think the NTH100 has above average detail retrieval. It is no worse than the far more expensive Odyssey LCD2. With all of Rhodes' marketing, I was a little bit disappointed to see nothing about Soundstage. Rhodes' marketing makes not even a passing mention of Soundstage ability. 
As you know, Soundstage is affected by the original recording, ear pads, placement, tuning of your headphones, and whether they receive sufficient power for peak performance. These are all competing factors. Here, the 100 does not present wide Soundstage. It is, to be honest, noticeably wider than what you would hear on Beats headphones. But the 100 is not noticeably wider than the LCD-1 or the HD6XX. I have a soundstage scale. Once again, I use the HD6XX and LCD-1 as my average performers. Headphones that have more or less soundstage than these two are judged accordingly. The Odyssey Mobius and all Beats headphones have claustrophobic soundstage. The NDH20 and ATH M60X have below average soundstage. The HD6XX and LCD-1 have average soundstage. The Sivka Phoenix, Emotiva GR1, and Ultrasome Pro 1480i have average to maybe above average soundstage, depending on the particular recording. The Hi-Fi Mansandara, Aventil Planar, Austrian Audio Hi-X55 and X65, and the LCD2 Classic all have above average soundstage. The Hi-Fi Mandiva has wide soundstage. The HD800S has super wide soundstage. In my opinion, the NTH100 has soundstage similar to the HD6XX and LCD1, and places it in the average category. Rhodes Marketing enthusiastically says that this headphone has flat tuning, allowing you to hear all the details, letting you experience the music as it was meant to be heard. This is marketing nonsense. We see it all the time with Odyssey, Sennheiser, and other brands, so it's no surprise to find it here with Rode. Funny enough, none of these brands seem to take their headphones to the recording artists and ask if they sound accurate to what they already mixed. I'm sure it's on their to-do list. Anyway, what is a bit surprising, however, is that for the most part, the NTH100 seems to have a fairly neutral rendition when compared to the Avatone Planar and the All OS 4X. The 100 has neutral sub-bass. Rode was particular about this in their marketing, and it seems to be true. However, I believe this headphone has a slight mid-bass emphasis. It is not significant, but seemed fairly noticeable in an A-B comparison. There's about average clarity in the bass region. The mids are neutral, or as neutral as I can tell. The 100 does not emphasize vocal sibilance or grain. Vocals are two steps ahead of instruments. There is above average clarity and separation in this region. The treble is also seemingly neutral. No matter what the instrument, I could not get this headphone to sound harsh or piercing at high volumes, and yet this headphone does not de-emphasize treble energy. The NTH100 has above average detail and about average soundstage. Maybe you can say this is a flat tuning. I am going to call it neutral. This might be to your liking, or you might want something with more emphasis in one region or another. As Rode has targeted this headphone towards professional use, those who prefer more treble or more bass or sharper vocals might walk away disappointed. It is imperative we conduct true A-B tests with gear. This is paramount whenever new gear hits the shelves. Here, the NTH100 is getting significant hype from both professionals and the typical audio community. Let's try to put things into perspective. We will compare the NTH100 against the Bear Dynamic DT700 Pro X. Oh boy, it just rolls off the tongue. The DT770 250 ohm variant and the Neumann NDH20. I use the stock ear pads for all headphones. I plug them into my passive AB switch, which itself was plugged into my RME ADI2 DAC. I listen to my test playlist on Amazon Music HD and Kobas. I tried to volume match. The DT700 has a slight sub bass roll off compared to the NTH100. Transients is a little faster on the 700, but that is by very marginal accounts. However, mid bass is slightly emphasized on the NTH100, while on the DT700, mid bass seems to be closer to neutral. Separation and clarity was slightly more obvious on the 100. The mids are somewhat different. The NTH100 does not emphasize vocal sibilance or grain. The DT700 does have a slight emphasis of sibilance. Vocals are generally two steps ahead of instruments on both headphones. Separation of mid-centric elements is a little bit more obvious on the 100. The treble sounded similar. Both headphones appear to have neutral or close to neutral rendition. It seemed that the 100 had a bit more clarity and separation in this region. Neither headphone sounded harsh, even at excessive volumes. The NTH100 has greater detail retrieval. In my new light test, the 700 presented seven footsteps. The 100 has slightly wider soundstage than the DT700. The DT770 has a sub-bass roll-off. It has a bit less sub-bass presence than the DT700. In comparison, the NTH100 is closer to neutral. 
Mid bass is harder on the 100. Separation of sub bass from mid bass is clearer and more obvious on the 770. There's more bass bleed into the mids on the 100. The mids are quite different. The NTH 100 presents a neutral rendition and does not emphasize vocal grain or sibilance. The DT 770 does have an obvious emphasis of both types of details. Vocals are generally a little bit closer to the ears on the 100. There's a bit more clarity and separation in the mids region on the 100. Trouble response is similar. Both headphones seems to have a neutral or close to neutral rendition. However, the 770 is typically a little bit clearer in this region. The NTH 100 presents instruments closer to the ears. The NTH 100 has slightly greater detail retrieval. In my new light test, the 770 rendered 7 to 8 footsteps. The 770, however, has wider soundstage. The NDH-20 has a sub-bass roll-off compared to the NTH-100. It has more sub-bass emphasis than the DT-770, but not quite as much as the DT-700. Mid-bass impact is a little harder on the NTH-100. Separation of sub-bass from mid-bass is a bit more obvious on the NTH-100. The mids are a little different. Neither headphone accentuates vocal sibilance, but the NDH-20 appears to have a slight reduction in sibilance compared to the NTH-100's more neutral rendition. The NDH-20 also has a slight emphasis in vocal grain. Both headphones place vocals close to the ears, but the NTH-100 presents them a little bit closer. The trouble is different. The NTH-100 has a seemingly neutral rendition. The NDH-20 has a slight emphasis particularly in the mid to upper treble region. Treble instruments always sounded a little closer to the ears on the NDH-20. The NTH-100 had greater separation and clarity in this region. The NTH-100 has significantly greater detail retrieval and noticeably wider soundstage than the NDH-20. Comparisons like these help us figure out if there's anything new with the new stuff. Sometimes the gear we already have is plenty good, and the hype machine is simply doing its job. Here, it is clear that the NTH-100 has a different presentation than the headphones I compared. All of them have their own strengths and weaknesses. You may like one or hate them all and the only way to know for sure is for you to listen yourself. Rode is not the first microphone company to release a headphone. Blue Microphones has several options, including a planar magnetic headphone, which by the way is great. The question is, why did Rode decide to make a headphone? Isn't there enough competition already? Why enter an already oversaturated market, especially if you don't have any prior experience? You'd have to do things quite differently to stand apart. Rode, I think, tried to do that with the NTH-100, and maybe not always in the best way. The design, aesthetics, and build are obvious points. Yes, this headphone looks and feels different from the litany of $150 headphones in the market, not to mention everything above this price range. The ear pads and headband are darn comfortable, and a huge leap ahead of the typical competition where comfort is concerned. But sound signature is another matter. The NTH-100 has a fairly neutral rendition. It has neutral sub-bass, but a slightly emphasized mid-bass. The mids and treble appear to be neutral. This headphone has above-average detail retrieval, but average soundstage. It has depth and width. It is clear without sounding analytical. It has an intimate presentation without sounding muffled or veiled. Maybe something like this excites you. But remember, we already have great options in the market. The DT770 has been a staple in studios for generations. The Sony MDR series, along with the Audio-Technica M40 and M50, have been favorites among professionals for decades. So it's not like the industry was begging for another option. But it hasn't. I cannot speak for professionals. I don't write, compose, or play music. People keep asking me about recommendations for professional or semi-pro use cases, and I keep telling them to ask in professional audio-visual forums, not HeadFi or other audiophile outlets. So, this is just a perspective from an audiophile. I do not care about the price tag, as I know from thorough experience that price has little to do with performance. What I instead care about is whether the NTH-100 does things differently. Technically, yes. But materially, maybe. Or maybe not. This brings us to value. Look, at $150, this headphone is a good bargain. You get excellent construction, good fit and comfort, and a neutral sound signature. I noticed on B&H, Adorama, and other sites that the NTH-100 was supposed to be $250, but was discounted at launch for $150. Now, those websites just show it as $150. 
So assuming that the $150 price is the true price, yeah, no doubt in my mind that this headphone is value. But whether you should click on the purchase button is a separate matter. The fact is that you may not need it. If you're happy with your DT770 or M40X or whatever else you've been using, then what's the point of buying another headphone? If you're happy with your music, with your current gear, spending another $150 on new toys seems a little unnecessary. I cannot say whether you or anybody else will enjoy the NTH100. You might find a dozen reasons to hate it. But in my opinion, this headphone is a serious contender for anybody. The price seems right for what you get. If you're looking for a new headphone, you may want to keep this one on the list among the others.